Last summer, three men and three women, three of them believers and three not so sure, volunteered to spend four weeks at an Islamic retreat in southern Spain. Welcome, welcome to Rosales. I'm not trying to be cheesy, but I do feel as if uh, a drop of religion is actually touching the flower in my soul and it is blossoming. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. I feel quite greedy. I just want to grab everything I can from it. I'm not sure what to make of all this, to be honest with you. I can't understand why I want somebody would sit silent for an hour. Why would you do that? Leading the retreat is respected teacher and Muslim convert, Abdullah Trevathan. I think people today are looking for the spiritual dimension to their lives, for a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose. The problem is they don't know how to achieve this. And that's really what we want to show them during this month. The aim is not to convert people, but if they come here with an open mind and they immerse themselves in what we're doing, then I believe it will be a life-changing experience. The retreat is set in the quiet isolation of Andalusia on the historic frontier between Islamic and Christian civilizations. It welcomes visitors of any faith and caters to all Muslims by focusing on the spiritual roots of Islam. So far, it's been an intense experience for the six volunteers and ten days in, they're beginning to react against the concentrated routine of prayer and introspection. Watch our special. <laughs> <laughs> We're kind of breaking all the rules oh. of spirituality. Azim! Present! A shroom! He's, he's left, so he's probably going to arrive in the UK around. What's the time in the UK now? It's all Which one? It's hard letting go of the habits from the outside world, and each one of them has struggled in their own way. In a sense, coming to a place like this, there's, there's nothing, and you're, you're thrown back on yourself. So it's our task now to make sure that they focus in on the spiritual path. To keep the group focused, Abdullah has asked them to stick to a rigorous schedule built around Islam's traditional five daily prayers. The day begins at 5 a.m. with Fajr, the pre-dawn prayer. When he first arrived at the retreat, ad salesman Azim Ziai was reluctant to even enter the mosque. As a child, he rebelled against his strict Muslim upbringing. But now, things are starting to change. For 34 years, I had an opportunity every single day. I had the actual, you know, I had the information on tap. But I didn't once ever try and fill up my glass and try and drink any of it because I just thought, well, it doesn't interest me, it kind of bores me. But this place, I just flipped the script, man. Hey, hey, Jack. Toss, a town near Mashhad in modern Iran. Toss, toss. <laughs> Sorry. All right. <clears throat> Victor and Duas in Ghazali's thought. The usage of the 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 daily routine includes the labour around the estate. It's an activity that Muslim convert Khadija has really taken to. In the outside world, she struggles to like herself and feels unworthy of her faith. But total immersion in all aspects of the retreat is starting to pay off. Allahu well, Akbar, you have this hard out shell and you're gradually stripping layers away and, you know, I feel that they're really getting to me now. <laughs> Abdullah has assembled a team of British Muslims to help on the retreat and teach the daily classes of religious instruction. Like him, they are Sufis who emphasise mankind's mystical relationship with God. Literally, our spirit has been, you know, wrenched out from our bodies. You look for the, the commonality, you look um, for the, the similar things. 
science graduate Simon Yarrow came onto the retreat looking for answers after a brush with cancer and a traumatic divorce. But he's struggling to engage on anything but an intellectual level. That's the central truth of, of all the religions, and that's how I try and live. You know, and I didn't really need to come here to, to realize that. You know, that's... <laughs> Afternoons on the retreat are set aside for silent contemplation, an essential part of the spiritual journey. Despite exploring a variety of different beliefs and faiths, psychotherapist Pom Jenkins has never found what she's looking for. I think a lot's going on. I am really beginning to think about thinking about Islam. Sal. Sal. Lam. Lam. Wa. Wa. Lay. Lay. Kum. Kum. I don't think realistically I'm going to, in four weeks, I'm going to suddenly become a Muslim, but... <sighs> but maybe it's kind of the beginning of a process. I don't know. That's that one rash and back of it. If anything, from standing down and standing up. It's definitely an interesting, really interesting time. But not everyone has responded so positively. Law graduate Aisha Alvi finds much to disapprove of. One of her main concerns being the daily sessions of dhikr or remembrance of God. In the classical Sufi tradition, dhikr involves chanting the names of Allah or sections from the Quran as a way of accessing the divine. But in Aisha's version of Islam, any practice not set out in the holy text is not condoned by Allah and is not therefore legitimate. Allah's names were being recited over and over again in a manner that I've never really been used to. It's something that I didn't particularly join in, um, simply because this isn't something I'm used to, do, to doing in congregation, and it doesn't really feel... Um, it doesn't really feel right or sit with me very well. Aisha is indicative of a particular type of Islam, which is at some odds with the classical traditional position. In my view, it's a superficial, prescriptive, dry, formulaic uh, interpretation of Islam. 23-year-old Madassa Ahmed has also resisted life at the retreat, but not for religious reasons. He's struggling to disengage from his numerous business interests back home. <laughs> Just to let you know, I ain't slept again. Because of him over the road. It's just that it's he was on the phone till about two. <laughs> Abdullah dispatches Iqbal, one of the retreat's teachers, to intervene. I'm using the phone till two o'clock is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. There's no other way left for me, so if you could give me your phone. Thank you. Is this the only one? No. <laughs> I need all of them. You know, this whole thing about cutting off, I'm not sure about that, because I think I can just as much engage here and engage in my other things with no problem. I think I can handle both. I don't see the need to cut off completely. Hmm, something to think about. Learning how to transcend the distractions of the modern world is crucial on the spiritual path. I'm talking here about iPods and mobile phones and all the other things that we have to entertain and occupy our attention away from what's going on at a deeper level. To, to achieve a, a complete state of inner peace is, is, is a lifetime struggle. But I'd like the group to get a taste of something of it by introducing to the concept of presence, of being totally present in the moment. For Abdullah, developing a sense of presence is key to engaging with the divine. Presence is the quality of total consciousness in being here now. It's a higher awareness. One of the big things about presence is getting to know yourself your faults, your patterns, your, your, your good points, and then ultimately your essential nature. As the Prophet said, he who knows himself 
knows his Lord. But then to do all this, um, to have that sort of presence and to have that God consciousness, to an extent we have to truly understand Allah. And maybe in a way we didn't, haven't really kind of done that. We have to understand ourselves to understand Allah. He who knows himself yeah. knows his Lord. But then you can't do it the other way around. Really. But don't we have to know Allah as well to know ourselves? It's both. With her legal training and literal interpretation of Islam, Aisha resists Abdullah's more flexible approach and tackles him on every point. If we truly kind of understand those, then it does give you a kind of hope. You can, you can intellectualise it as much as you like, but until you actually feel something happening, then you won't put those into perspective. Yeah. Well, let's put it this way. We have a general theory, yeah. but it's rather than it being up here, yeah. it's having it in here. As we go through life, every moment presents itself before us as an open space. Tabula uh, rasa, an open space. If you're clonking all the past stuff, clonking it into that space, then you're not really being present. You're not really being in the moment. And I'm trying to get Aisha to see that it's, it's a little confrontational, it's a little difficult I'm not sure, to be honest, if she's going to be able to, to see through. I'm, I'm praying that she does. To achieve this state of spiritual presence, Abdullah expects a physical presence in the mosque for all five daily prayers, plus the dhikr and evening wadifa. So far, turnout has been erratic with only Simon, an agnostic, making it every time. Abdullah wants the group to make a personal commitment to attending each prayer and dhikr. All agree to commit, except Aisha, who is particularly reluctant to join in the early morning dhikr. I mean, the only thing for me is, personally, I tr try like to do my own, if I'm sitting there, because just for me, the chanting doesn't really help me particularly. Okay. So, so I bring my own book, but because of the chanting, I find that kind of distracting, so I can't concentrate on what I'm doing. All right, are you willing to commit to the other things? Yeah. Okay. All five prayers mm. and the wadifa in the evening. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. During break, Madassa seizes the chance to lodge an appeal against the confiscation of his mobile phones. Your use of the mobile phones was beginning to impinge on other people. Now that flaunts the values that we're trying to kind of get across to you in the face. I want to keep what I've got here on the outside world. So obviously there needs to be some crossover. Yeah, but you are not engaging with the retreat because you're in connection always to the outside. And the idea of the retreat yeah. is to retreat away from the world. I have my physical presence here. And, 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 yeah, but having the mobile yes, means that you, you, you constantly have a connection with the outside. So whatever's going on on the outside is going to affect your state. But we have no right to keep you away from your phones. But we are going to be calling upon you to be thinking very, very seriously about your use of the phones while you're on, on the retreat. Yeah? That's fair enough, yeah. Okay? Okay. Mudasa just needs to slow down and to consolidate his energies, because at the moment they're very scattered. The person who engages in the remembrance of, of Allah is a person who's gathered within themselves. You know, they're gathered, the energy's focused and gathered. You know, they're very clear when they set out to do something, the intention is very clear. Um, they're, they're very present and they're also detached as to the outcome. Mudasa at the moment is up and down, sideways, long ways, all over the place. The rest of the morning sees the group engaged in manual labor around the estate. Through working, Abdullah believes the group can develop a sense of humility and a generosity of spirit in relation to others. Rise above the horse poop. Yes, rise above it. No, no, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm going to take it. This is a challenge. This is my humbling experience. No, mate, there's lots of wind today. Just get down. Gosh, and I was worried about cleaning the toilet. Get a move on. Stop talking. Um... Azim's un-Islamic Western lifestyle 
has been an ongoing disappointment to his Muslim parents. But since being on the retreat, he's come to a surprising realization. The bit of Islam, and if that's what it is, the bit of Islam that has been passed down to me is some decency, some regards for other people. And in essence, that's what Islam is really teaching you, is just have some decency for people. It's an amazing job doing that. If that's what being a Muslim is about, then do you know what? I should start really being proud of it a bit more. Having grasped the essence of the religious message, Azim wastes no time putting it into practice. Keen for others to follow his example, he invites Madassa to help clean up the men's quarters. There comes a time where I'm going to have to shout at you. We have lots of work to do, man. You need to sweep and we need to wipe. You need to get up now. Serious. Come on, old man. What time do you make it? Quarter. Quarter what? Seven months. Seven, so it's time for, to pray, isn't it? Excuse me. I ain't got time for that. We're here, we're at the, regardless of what we're doing, we're still a team, you know what I mean? If we don't work together, then some of us are going to get irritated. And I'm starting to get irritated. Rising above his frustration, Azim decides to give Madassa the benefit of his newly acquired religious insight. As if, pff, this trivial little incident, yeah, just it actually, well it is trivial, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it's just your general, you know, I do feel as if, you do sometimes actually feel as if everybody's got to wait on your hand and foot. And your situation is, at home, people do wait on your hand and foot. They don't. We don't even pick up plates in your house. That's what you've told me. No, it's not no. me, to me, me making this up. The point is, um, it's difficult for all of us to be here, right? I understand and, that. Um, and I'm not trying to make and, things and difficult no, for no, you. No, you're not. But I think you, you seem to think that I've had things very easy. Um, and I have life very easy, and that I've been kind yeah, of but, pampered. Yeah. But I think that's completely wrong. Yeah, but regardless, I mean, I've worked very hard in my life. So have I. Very, very so hard. have I. And Try and do some stuff yeah. for other people. That's mm. all I'm saying. Try and do show mankind that you're doing something for them. By by what you're saying, you're yeah. implying that I am not a particular type of person. I'm not considered. You're not very helpful. Yeah, yeah helpful. exactly. You've hit the nail on the head yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. You're that's not what considered. You're yes, but I disagree with that assessment. That's you. I welcome the fact that you're concerned. Um, and you're looking at it from a brotherly point of view, and I and I'm I just teaching you normal decency as a that's person. Sweet. That's really sweet. That's really nice, right? And it's nice that you're concerned, and that's a good thing. And I will bear that in mind. But please, 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 don't pass judgment. I'm looking out for you. That's yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's sweet. Okay. Yeah. All right, mate. All right. Then. Take care. Take care. Having introduced the group to the idea of presence. Abdullah wants them to understand how to access this state for themselves. The lesson Not for the first time, uh, Aisha is absent. What we're trying to uncover is the essential self. It's that primordial being which each one of us has within us, <clears throat> which is free of all of the, the trappings of the baggage, the likes and the dislikes. What's on offer is the, the chance to, to transcend the normal human condition. So that means when you go back out into the world, the scatteredness, the busyness, you'll have a place somewhere within you to get something of a nuance of the essential self. I don't know, I'm very much affected by things happening around me. And um, even while you were talking earlier on, my mind was just figuring out strategy. I can't stop it. Mm -hmm. What you have there is the, is, is the was was, is the constant chatter. The blah, 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 yeah? When we listen to the was was, when our lives are led by our personalities and our character and they've taken charge, we only, we're, we're, we're blown wherever that leads us. That doesn't mean that we want anybody to lose their personalities. But what we try to do is to not make them command us. The aim of uncovering the essential self is about creating this thing, this conscious presence, I am. 
Just, just, just think about what that means for a minute. I am. Not I am mudasr, or I am happy. Just I am. When you get to the essential self, it goes above the things that you like, the things that you don't like, the things that upset you, the things that don't upset you. And you realize that you have been given incredible freedom. While POM responds instinctively, Simon struggles to disengage his rational brain and silence the waswas. I did actually sit there for most of it really feeling what we were talking about. Really, it did, and it was just I felt so, so at peace and so calm and so centered and so can relax you yet alert. Like, and do you think you have to be religious to feel it? No, absolutely not. It's it's beyond any kind of definition or, or any name. I think. Mm -hmm. See, for me, my thinking is so much part of my consciousness. I almost feel. If I'm not thinking, I'm not doing the in the present thing. Well, I think your in the present thing is not really about thinking. Simon is somebody who has one of the great afflictions of our times, a constant uh, questioning of everything. Everything needs to have a reason. Everything needs we need to we demand reason. Always, and there are some things which have no, no reason. There's some things that just are. There's paradox. There's paradox. Simon is greatly in need of information as to when, why, and where, what he's doing, why he's doing it, etc., etc. We're trying to encourage him to just sit back, uh, disengage intellectually, and engage more with the heart. It's quite a difficult task to do and we have a short period of time to do it. Abdullah suspects Simon's reluctance to engage emotionally is rooted in his past. He asks Rahma, one of the retreat's mentors, to see if she can help. Her instinct is to ask Simon about his divorce. What happened? I came home one night from work and was told that the relationship was over and two or three days later she walked out. Was there somebody else involved? Um, well, that's a, um, I did ask that. There was somebody who was helping her through the divorce. She did tell me that, that there was nothing going on with them, although she did subsequently have a relationship with that person. Okay. I, I feel I've failed at this without having had any chance not to fail at it, because the, the decision was totally out of my hands. Mm. Probably your idea that you failed is also kind of blocking you in a sense. Part of the spiritual process isn't just going Allah, what were, and you know, praying, and it's untying those mm. knots, because that's what gives us our inner freedom. You have to ask, and go from here, uh -huh. and say to whatever you believe in, I don't know what, you know, Allah, I, you know, I call Allah, whatever, mm. and just ask. But it's, then surely I have to believe first, that's the problem. How, how believe, can, believe what? Well, well, believe in Allah, or believe in God, or believe in no, some of the I'm divine being. No, I'm saying you have to believe, believe well, I, in that sense. But then I'd be asking nothing. You, you, but I'm not asking you to believe in Allah, I'm asking to believe that you have a spirit and a heart and a soul and these are the things that you've got to be feeding. Uh -huh. yeah. okay. If that brings you to Allah, alhamdulillah. As part of the routine, the group attends the evening Hadifa. And though Aisha has agreed to come, she's still not comfortable with this form of worship.
despite being separated from his mobile phones, Madassa seems increasingly comfortable, and Azim's brotherly intervention has got him thinking about how he relates to others. My friends would say that the single biggest criticism that they'd say about me is the fact that I am all over the place and spread out thinly. Well, my sister, can, you know, they complain they don't even know me. <laughs> you know, they don't even know their own brother. Um, my mother complains that she, she finds me uh, too distant to relate to. And that is a very essential human quality that I need to build. You know, people build up barriers to emotion. They have do out. you build up barriers to emotion? I think I probably I do, yeah. It's okay mm. to express emotions. I have a feeling that there's a volcano <laughs> underneath there. <laughs> an emotional volcano. There's an emotional volcano. And you don't really like dealing with it. And one way to deal with it is to scatter. Mm. To scatter yourself so that you're not dealing with it. Mm. You're talking about you know, your relationship with your mother and your sisters. Mm -hmm. That's what that's about. Mm. The reason they feel distant from you is because you're not showing them any emotion. Mm -hmm. And you think that emotions were gonna, are going to... They're, they're messy and they get in the way. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Because they hold people back. You think it holds them back? Mm. Do you still believe that? Any sort of... Mm, I don't know. I think, to be honest, that you would fill out incredibly as an individual if you did allow yourself a bit more emotion. It's nearly halfway through the retreat and Abdullah wants to test the group's understanding of presence by taking it out of the classroom and into the surrounding countryside. One of the important things in Muslim spirituality is the need to be at one with the environment that you find yourself in. So today we want to let the group experience something of a oneness with nature. Whatever stillness they find there, we would like them to be able to take that back out into the big wide world they're going to return to after the retreat. Aisha gives up after just 10 minutes. I feel too ill and too hot. And I need some shade. Okay, just hold, hold whatever you had there and splash yourself down. If you want to go and pray, pray, go to lunch. For Khadija in particular, learning to be alone with her thoughts is a huge challenge. I just felt myself breathing very deeply reciting the name of Allah subconsciously, not even having to think about it. And when you can take a deep breath and really feel a connection with the ground um, a fit and, a, and a spiritual connection, it just came to me this absolutely overwhelming feeling of inner peace and totally at one with myself. I just need to be able to bottle it now and have it on tap for whenever I need it. And if I can continue, you know, carrying out my day-to-day -day duties with this feeling of peace and tranquility, then I will be a happy person for, for the rest of my life, inshallah. 
Azim went quite high up, so he's probably gone off on one of his jaunts. He did say but uh, a part of the exercise is um, to make it work, is to actually tread carefully. And while you're walking firmly but quietly, you can actually hear things like the birds. You can hear the wind. You can hear bees and, and the flies buzzing around you. You can, you can kind of hear other things that, you know, kind of don't make sense, but... If you're spiritual, you actually start bonding with the earth and you start actually, that's when you start being present within the, within the environment, I suppose. I mean, that's the kind of thing that we're learning here, is, is to being present, I mean, actually accessing them doors of, of, of being able, or accessing that ability to, to be present. Despite being willing, all Madassa got from sitting out in the wilds was sunburn. He's keen to find out what he's doing wrong and hopes, inshallah, God willing, that Khadija will be able to help. Well, I was interested in your experience of feeling disconnected enough to be able to shut out all other feelings. Mm. And I was sort of curious as to how you, you managed to sort of get to that state. I've been sort of trying to use my contemplation time and time in the evenings to just be. What does just be mean to you? To just sit yeah. and breathe and not think. Try, trying not to think about anything. I think the acid test will be in how to feel the way you feel mm -hmm. and still function normally. I feel like I'm still functioning normally. If I can still go about my daily business but with an air of elation, then surely... Will that, will that not affect your judgement? <clears throat> no. No, not at all. I don't think it will. I still feel perfectly rational and able to rationalise things. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be having this conversation with you now if I didn't. I'm almost holding myself because... Don't. Just go with it. I've been doing that. I've been trying to rationalise it and you just can't. Yeah. It's total submission. Well, thanks for that. Yeah, inshallah, if you can, if you can learn to, to not restrain it and not, yeah. not think about it consciously, just go with it. Mm. Yeah, inshallah, you'll be able to have some of it. Inshallah. I'm well impressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Well, I, I hope to be there as well. Inshallah. The group is getting to grips with the concept of presence, and Abdullah is keen to keep up the pressure. Today's class, led by religious scholar Iqbal, is the ultimate test. Being present to the reality of death and your own mortality. You release any air, whatever. Then the rest Iqbal addresses this unsettling concept by demonstrating the Islamic practice of washing the dead. Then the left. But you just need to, there's no dirt that you're trying to get over. You just ritually is purifying. It's metaphorical. Yeah. She just left. Yeah, that's it. So you can. One of you would pull and the other would rub. But not too hard, just. Okay. It's a particularly sensitive subject since each member of the group has had some close experience of death in their lives. It's all right, you just hold it. Both Simon and Khadija have survived life-threatening illnesses, while Midassa, Pom and Azim have lost loved ones. When she was just 12, Pom's older sister died of leukemia. The body just leaves the house for the graveyard. Thank you, Azim. Thank you very much. I want to ask Azim, how, how did he feel? I was thinking about death in, in my family. Well, I've only really seen one person pass away. Okay. That was my grandma, and she, she lived with us for about 22 years. Uh -huh. I was imagining the actual the texture of the skin, the way the eyes were, uh -huh. the smell, okay. the feeling. Yes. So you were there. You yeah. were present. You were feeling those things. Well, yeah. For me, it was just a mixture of different feelings. Mo most of it was kind of a feeling that this is, it's just had to happen. And it's written, and it's Qadr Allah, will of God. You know, we believe that our, the times of our birth and our death are appointed. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Yeah? Something that happens to everybody. Yeah. Okay? Go on, sit down. Be brave. Oh. Chest out. So this is not your lip. No, it's my It's okay. <laughs> It's all right. It's the only one thing it is certain. That's the only thing <laughs> that of certainty that we have in our lives mm. is dying. But it's 
the thought that you know we always try to get away from. Mm. Yeah, we don't want to face up to it. And the whole thing of presence is that you listen. You're there. I've always had this real feeling that death could be around the corner, and that's motivated me. And it's weird, but it's motivated me to do as much as I can with my life. Every second is valuable. I think having your father die so young and not knowing what he wanted from you, and being under his shadow, and my father was a successful man, you know, and it kind of it's driven me to to where I am now. It's been played a very very strong role in my life. Do you want to say anything, Prem? Um, yeah, I mean, seeing Azim there, just, it kind of reminded me of, um, being there when my sister died, and I was, I wasn't kind of old enough at the time to, <laughs> to process it, and I don't think I have, and I just kind of felt like I was there. I'm over again. Mm. My grandma used to say, God gives you a soul, and, and this body we've got is just a shell which you give us for this soul. The soul lives on. That is what religion gives you guys, and that is what I don't have. I've looked death right in the face, yeah, and I'm scared shitless of dying. You know, if you're present with yourself, you actually shouldn't be afraid of death. When you are always present with your Lord, it doesn't matter if it's in this body or you've gone somewhere else because you're always with him. But it's this thing that you have to develop. It takes time. It doesn't come like this. But you actually learn. Iqbal's class has a profound effect on them all, especially Pom. I realised talking about losing my sister that it's not something has really happened. It's not such a raw wound um, that's kind of festering away anymore. It's it's somehow been dealt with. Um, so that's a, actually a massive relief. I feel much more. I feel lighter, definitely. Um, and so much in, in my siesta, I came to, to bed and I didn't sleep although I was so tired. I just had so many thoughts going through my head about kind of habits I've developed, um, kind of personality traits and defence mechanisms and things. And I felt like I had real clarity today. There is no doubting the group's increasing focus, but Azim's enthusiastic return to the Islamic fold is about to take an unexpected detour. She's very, very strict in her Islamic ways, and you know, it's a, it's a kind of ideal girl to have. Not I'm saying that I'd ever get with her, or I don't even know. She probably don't even like me at all. But she's the type of woman that I'm kind of aiming for now. I want it that it's a bit more religious, a bit more Islamic, because I am a Muslim. I've started to realise that I have. I, I am a Muslim. My father's a Muslim. His father was a Muslim. His father was a Muslim. So I am a Muslim. Maybe my parents would also really think, God, you've hit gold here. You know, you've met somebody who has got their head screwed on, who's basically just exactly, you know, epitomises Islam, and this is exactly what you need in your life. We can actually be very, we can hold up our head high and, and just think, that our, 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 our uh, son's got married to somebody extremely Islamic and extremely respectable. There's no such thing as the last word or the bitter end. Rather, there is always trial and error. I'm from your mistakes. Aisha has very clear ideas about what it means to be a good Muslim and finds a willing pupil in Azim. <laughs> you pick the bunch of one. Tell me which one to go for. I can't really Okay, go to that one behind. What, this one? Yeah. This one? Yeah. Abdullah has picked up on this unexpected development but fears Azim's affections may be in danger of distracting him. A lot of things have happened since we The reason I'm looking out for her is not just because I think she's, you know, that she'd be good for me if we... Yeah. I just feel as if she has, she's spent more time actually going through stuff about Islam with me. But, you know, I don't see... She, she, she's treating me well, and she said a couple of times, brother, so... 
yeah. There you go. But you're not going to get caught up now. No, 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 no. Look, let's put it this way. Unrequited love. No, 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 no. no. Our mission is to find spirituality okay. and, find, and learn about Islam. That's number one. Yeah, that's, that's paramount to me. Abdullah is not so sure. But as well as worrying about Azim, he's also concerned about Aisha's increasing withdrawal from the daily routine. The women have gathered for the evening Wadifa. While Khadija and Pom are happy to try and connect with the divine through the chanting, Aisha opts out, despite having agreed to attend. In some ways, each time I go, it, it's sort of different. And last couple of nights, I'm coming away kind of feeling that it's, it's just in terms of atmosphere, it's sort of generally feeling a bit, little bit like a sing-song. Maybe some people have enough of a chance, but it's just really not me, that whole kind of group thing. And I don't really agree with it. As well as going back on her commitment to attend the Wadifa, Aisha tries to convince Azim that chanting in congregation is wrong. For a lot of people, you could just be, what I was saying to you, you could just be reciting something, repeating it and repeating it, and it just becomes something that is mechanical and it's just pirate fashion. And you're not, it isn't anything to do with something that's connecting to your heart. It's just something you're just doing mechanically. Mm -hmm. It's more than halfway through the retreat, and Abdullah is increasingly concerned about Aisha's undermining influence. Some of the energy, some of the thrust of the retreat, which is for people to move on spiritually, is being somewhat hijacked <clears throat> by, by Aisha and Aisha's concerns. And it's a real, it's a, I'm really struggling to think what to do. I'm not judging her on the fact that she's not been able to go anywhere. This is obviously not her thing. This is not her understanding of Islam. All of that is fine. But my main concern is that she is affecting others. As the rest of the group sets off to work, Abdullah seeks out Aisha for a serious chat. At the moment, you know, our, our theme is presence. You're absent physically. You're, you're physically absent. But would you agree with me that obviously, because there are different ways of following Islam, in terms of it can be questionable about whether, from me, from my, where I'm sitting, it's I, questionable whether I should even be sitting in a gathering. I, 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 accept, right. that. I accept, accept that, I accept that. I accept that, I accept the position. Right, Yeah. yeah. But then you need to ask yourself if you're in the right place. If you've come to the decision that you know you're not to sit in the dicker, then you, you need to really think about whether you should be. But I can be sitting be. there. It doesn't mean I have to necessarily. But you're not sitting there. Well, you I'm... said that you didn't want to attend. That's the that's the point. Yeah. If you sit there, and you undergo it, you don't like it. Fine. Mm. But if you're not there, see, so with your with your being here, not partaking, mm. in a sense, you you know, you, you do impinge on others as well. You impinge on others. You know, you impinge on others progress as well, yeah? because we're a group. Do you remember the other day we made a commitment to ourselves, we made a commitment, to, commitment as a group, etc, etc. When you fall out, mm. it does affect things. I want to be here, but I'm not necessarily... But you want to be here on your own terms. No, I'm not just... Not, I'm, the only thing I'm not comfortable with is the vicar. No, the vicar is the main state of the program. If you're saying that I'm finding this difficult, then on a very serious note, maybe I really shouldn't just go. Well, those are the questions that you need to ask. Personally, I would be very happy if you stayed. I think that you'll benefit, even if it's in disagreement. I think it's going to widen your experience of the Muslim world. It's going to familiarize you with a, with a, with a part of Islam that you're, not, that you're not familiar with. This is about you taking responsibility for your, for your actions and your participation. Okay. 
Aisha takes Abdullah's words as an ultimatum and turns to the group for support. He was saying, you know, I can't have, we can't have special rules for me because then other people might want to withdraw. And if I want to be part of this program, I'm here at the retreat and I have to get attend a vicar because the vicar is a big part of the program. I understand there are certain things that, you know, you hold as your your principles. Um, but coming, looking from the outside, you do seem to be quite inflexible and not very open to looking at new things. Um, you know, if you do just want to come and have your have your say then, you know, that's welcome. Um, but equally, I think we'd all like you to get something extra out of that. And the only way to do that, I think, is to open up a bit. So I know what I've been in my heart at the end of the day. And if I don't feel comfortable with something, I can only go with that. I can't pretend or lie. I'm not that kind of person. But realistically, what you do impacts on all of us as well. We've come here like a team. We've, got, we've come here like a team. And we'd like to leave happy like a team. Yeah. Not minus one. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. So, and that's, that's the deal, and then regardless of what you miss and what you come to, do as much as you can. If you don't do it for these people, do it for us. And spend as much time as you can with us, and leave with five more friends. After dinner, Aisha retires to consider her verdict, leaving Azim fearing the worst. My emotions about the whole of this retreat has been swayed by one person. Yeah. I don't know if it's a good thing or if it's a bad thing. I'm enjoying doing the namaz and I'm going along with other things. And now I feel as if... Because of one person... and the possibility of them leaving is going to sway the way I feel about this place. Abdullah has decided it's time for the group to put all they've learned about presence into practice in the outside world. He's arranged a two-day visit to Morocco. With just 14 kilometers separating Christian Spain from Islamic North Africa, it's an ideal opportunity for the group to experience Islam for real. With only minutes to spare, Aisha decides to join them. For me, Morocco is a very special place. It, it, it epitomizes the spirit of Islam. So much so that it's the place that I became a Muslim 30 years ago. Knowing it as I do, I know that it can be quite overwhelming for someone who comes new to it for the first time. Which is perfect for us because we want to take the group out of the safe zone. And if they can maintain a sense of gatheredness in the sea of change going on around them, then they will have access something of presence. With its roots in the nomadic deserts of Arabia, traveling in company features heavily in the Islamic tradition. <laughs> Learning to rise above the inevitable stresses and strains and dealing with the unexpected is seen as a way of deepening understanding of the self. Some of you may want to know where we're going tonight, where we're going to be, who we're going to be with. Guess what? I don't know. <laughs> what I want you to be present to is that we're, we're just, we're, we're, it's what we call tawakullah. We're placing our, ourselves in the hands of Allah and we're just going to fall backwards and we're going to hope that we're going to get caught. The only arrangement Abdullah has made is to visit an Islamic scholar he knows in the city of Tetuan, 26 miles away. God, I can't believe there's no kind of actual plan. Maybe that's part of the whole thing, you know, the spiritual journey. You don't really plan a spiritual journey, do you? And that maybe that's a part of actually finding yourself as well, putting okay. yourself through so much pressure. Yeah. For their whole time in Morocco, Abdullah is relying entirely on the hospitality of Sufi friends. When they finally arrive in Tetuan, as expected, 
the hosts immediately throw open their homes to the group. In keeping with Muslim practice, the men and the women will stay in separate quarters. Are you okay? Home? Yeah? Khadija, are you feeling okay? No. What's the problem? Just because I'm used to having things planned and I know exactly what I'm doing. Okay, and it's just leave a bit, it to Allah. A little while, and it's a bit. Leave it to Allah. Okay. That's what the truth's about. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tired and unsettled, Khadija's ability to be present in the moment has deserted her. The men have been invited to take part in a special prayer gathering at the local mosque. And the women to attend a wadifa. The men start to perform the hadra, which in the classical tradition literally means presence. It's believed that by reciting the names of Allah, the Hadra is a way of getting closer to God. Aisha struggles to contain her disapproval. Sufis believe that when they experience a connection to the divine, it causes a momentary physical response similar to an electric shock. <laughs> but for Azim, witnessing this intense spiritual state has left him feeling unsettled. Yeah. I've never witnessed it before. Yeah, I know, because I've in Britain... I've never people bumping into people well, you know, you, know, you know what it is? It's not prevalent in Britain, but it is prevalent across the Muslim world. Is it a spiritual thing that's happening here? Yes, of course it is. So it's not, it's not purely Islamic then? It's not purely Islamic. So what I'm trying to say, what's happening here, yeah. it's more spiritual than anything, because you're saying they're going yeah, into a spiritual state. Yeah, but spirituality is intertwined with Islam. No, what I'm trying to say, when they're going yeah, into a listen, state, the, the, when, they, listen, when they're going into a state, yeah. what's happening to Islam because they're so religious, but they lose control. Yeah, what? that's what's going on. Yeah, it's called so, yeah. Right. So yeah. that's more of a spiritual thing going on than an Islamic thing going on. Why are you separating the two? Why are you keen on separating the two? For them, for these guys here, right. this is the epitome of their Islam. For somebody else, mm. this might not be their thing. Mm. For them, the epitome of their Islam might be something totally different. But I don't understand why you're so keen on separating the two. The two are intertwined. No, I'm not. I'm not separating no, what I'm saying them. Is I'm throughout get, I'm throughout to... Islamic lands, right. it is established that this is how a lot it of people... It is funny. I've never, I've never seen it before. Guys, come, come in here, come in here, come in here, yeah? Come down here, yeah? Namaste. Wanna? Ah. What they're saying to me is that they're so intoxicated with the love of God that they're falling all over the place. What? <laughs> Next day, Abdullah arranges a visit to the tomb of a famous Muslim saint. But after the excitement of the night before, Madassa is still on a spiritual high. I'm learning to see the deeper significance of what's going on. I'm learning to, to allow what's going on to affect me and to taste it. I have to taste it. And I think I'm beginning to do that. But he's still troubled by Azim's dismissive attitude. Last night, um, it seemed to me that um, he was um, was trying to say that um, what these guys are doing is wrong. And for me, being in that, like, being like all kind of, you're trying to say that how I'm feeling right now is wrong? What gives you the right to say that? And, and I think that's been influenced by Aisha. <laughs> Yesterday, he sent a text message from my mobile phone to Aisha, um, saying, 
I know what you mean about this bumping around stuff. I've seen it now. You know, that implied that our conversation makes sense. So she's obviously filled him up with some preconceptions that he's come here with, and then he's gone woo woo. You see that? I saw that, and that made me. That's what made me angry. Is that there are people going out there evangelically trying to tell people this is un-Islamic, this is wrong, you know, you shouldn't do that. And you know, don't. If you have a genuinely adverse, you genuinely don't like it. But then there's a difference between like and you thinking it's not Islamic. You see, he said it's not Islamic. The group is led up to the tomb of Moulay Abdul Salam Mashish. It's a place of pilgrimage, and along with other visitors to the shrine, they join in recitation from the Quran. This place is a place of divine presence. It is my belief, and it is the belief of many, many others, that if you go to places like this, and the greatest of which would be Mecca, or the, the grave of the Prophet, if you go to places like this, and you're open, we believe that it will bring about a spiritual change within you. Spiritual change is already a reality for Madassa, but with the exception of Pom, the rest of the group seems unwilling or unable to engage. I did feel very, very connected indeed, not only to the people in the group, but to something greater and the actual location, the music, the people's voices, I just found really uplifting. I looked into those people's faces, honestly to the right of us. Yeah. I felt frightened. I've never, I've never been in a religious gathering and felt scared. It's all right, Rosanna. I can cope with it there, but not in the community. Weird stuff. I'm a Muslim as well. I'm a Muslim as well. If there's something here, it should touch my heart. To you know. Feel it, can't see it. The trip to Morocco has split the group and threatens to disrupt the retreat. But the final week would produce even more unforeseen results. Okay, so I guess the cat's out of the bag. I had what I consider to be a spiritual experience. You know, it's not as if I'm lusting after the woman. I'm looking at the bigger picture. She might, you know, just come through. I might have really backed the right horse. I had so many jokes before I came out. Oh, God, you're going to come back with a hijab and um, you're going to be a Muslim. Oh. But, you know, maybe, maybe I will. So the final week of retreat here on BBC Two next Monday, same time, nine o'clock.